Welcome back to the Lore of the Vanquished Dominion, an expansive series exploring my very own fantasy world and its many fascinating details. In this episode, we will explore the various peoples of the world and their unique origins, but before we can do that, we need to clear something up. In this world, there are, for example, various types of humans, each with unique cultures and traditions. They are, however, not separate species, but just different types of humans with subtle variation in skin color and other minor traits. This would be why I'm using the neutral term peoples, as opposed to something like species or race. This fact, along with the point you'll see later, is why my fantasy peoples are not referred to in a more, let's just say traditional way. With that over, let's talk basics. There are six broad categories of sapient life on Magnus. These are... Humans. Humans are, well, humans. They are the most diverse people and are the standard by which every other people is measured. They are widespread across the globe, controlling most major nations and the global economy as a whole. Humans are like most peoples and are split up into many factions and distinct cultures, with the occasional bigotry and sometimes all out war. Elves. Elves are the second most widespread people but have been through years of terrible oppression to even eke out their pockets of population. But recently, they have gained more rights and their native land is being returned to them, if slowly. Elves are generally peaceful, or at least that's the stereotype, but have taken up arms to fight for their brothers and sisters throughout thousands of years of elven oppression. Elves are known mostly for their pointed ears and thinner body shapes. A main idea in my interpretation of elves is that they're basically just humans with a few genetic deformities that were cast out and developed unique cultures. So keep this in mind when we talk about the different types of elves later. Dwarves. Throughout history, dwarves were the savages in the far reaches of the world. Not often seen by most people, but the dwarves built up empires in the places that few besides them could survive, encountering and forming opinions of other races as they spread through mountains and hills. They once ruled a decent portion of Coleus's underground, and managed to spread to other parts of the world. They are seen by humans as skilled craftsmen and warriors, by elves as taller warmongers, and by orcs as sisters in arms. Dwarves are short and stocky, with their hair being an important part of dwarven features. Again, dwarves are fairly traditional in most fantasy, but I should also mention that they are an offshoot of a Neanderthal-like species of early hominid that never died out. Orcs. Orcs are the savage warriors of distant primitive lands, or so humans would have you believe, but the reality isn't too far off. The orcs are a people who value simplicity and independence, with the individual giving much more merit than any state or king. They are warlike, and will sooner kill than negotiate, and the orcs have often learned that bloodshed says more than words on a page. They raid, conquer, and divide the spoils between clan and kin. Orcs are more complicated than warriors, with many being brilliant scholars and politicians, but most of the world never sees that. Orcs are typically tall and bulky, with tough bones and muscles that grow at increased rates. The vast majority of orcs are female, with male orcs being smaller and more submissive due to an old virus that wipes out many males before they're even born. Orcs are, once again, fairly traditional in terms of modern fantasy, besides, of course, the all-female thing. Paleosaurs. Often thought mythical, paleosaurs are lizard-like humanoids that used to inhabit the entirety of the world and have been around since the shrouded ages of prehistory. Some are known to cultures as the Dragon Lords, riders and tamers of dragons that they used to conquer vast swaths of Magnus. To others, they are the builders of great ancient structures that defy time with their power and brilliance. To yet others, they are mortal gods that only come to Magnus when Armageddon dawns and the world is destroyed to be reborn anew. In truth, the Paleosaurs are all of these, vestiges of a distant memory from ages before man or dwarf. They have long since died or retreated to kingdoms far below the surface on which the other races vie for dominance. They are tall and alien, with scaly skin and red eyes that reflect light to make it easier to see in the darkness of their abysses underground. Not much is known beyond that, the Paleosaurs are simply the ghosts of a time long forgotten, when magic truly ruled and the world was more alien than the modern races can imagine. Morphane. Often thought to be demons from the depths of Umbra, in reality, the Morphane are but another race in a long line of oppressed peoples. 
They were dwarves once, corrupted by Sirog and the dark magic into shapeshifters and soldiers of pointless wars with mankind. They were ancient enemies, nearly destroying early civilizations before they could get off their feet. But when Sirog was defeated, the Morphine were free, and found their home in the far north. They are short and muscular, with pale white skin that often has an orange glow from their blood. They possess the unique ability to shapeshift. To do so, they need to perform a ritual that sucks out the soul of their victim and uses their body to take on their form. The Morphane are dangerous in this respect, but are often commanded by forces beyond them, not working of their own volition. The Morphane are a tragic people, caught right in the middle of an endless struggle between chaos and order, dark and light. Now that we have an overview, we can go into specifics. Only humans, elves, dwarves, and orcs have subtypes, so we'll go through those briefly, starting once again with the humans. The Vickards. The Vickards are a widespread people group that can mostly be found in the northern sections of the world. They originate from Morval, and are thought of as brutish and honorable. Their skin ranges from pale to fair, and hair color encompasses all colors, but orange red is the most common. The men are often seen sporting long dwarf-like beards, and the women have long, uncut hair. They range in height from 5 to 6 feet, and are bulky and heavy. Curlissians. The Curlissians are the original natives of Curlius, and can still be found there, but in much smaller numbers. They are thought of as passive and submissive due to their conquest by the Vickards, but this is easily disproven by their eventually successful rebellion against them. Their skin tends to be pale, and their hair color is dark, with black hair being the most common. Both men and women are often short and stocky, with hairy faces and bodies. They range in height from 4 to 5 feet, with few getting above 6. Meridani The Meridani are often considered to be the first humans at the birthplace of humankind in, where else, but Meridani. They have been stereotyped as savages, but had a complex belief system and tribal culture before their displacement. Their skin is dark and dusky, and they tend to be bulky with dark curly hair. Facial hair is uncommon, but it can be found. Both men and women are similar, with heights from 5.6 to 6.9 feet at the very largest. Arnesi. The Arnesi are a mix of Meridani and Colissian bloodlines that are adapted to live in the summerlands of Arnesia. They also form the core of House Moral's population. They are thought of as intelligent and greedy, with terrible horrors being inflicted upon them because of this stereotype. Their skin is dusky, and their hair is dark, with lighter tones being rare. Arnesi women are taller than the men, but the whole group ranges from 5 to 6 feet, with women on the taller end. Zhang The Zhang originated from Ragavusi in ancient times, but were forced to migrate by orc and raids, and ended up in Coleus with smaller numbers. Population control has brought the ethnicity back from the brink somewhat, but they're still a minority. The Zhang are thought of as intelligent and brave warriors, with most of Sindrarian's military being Zhang. Their skin ranges from warm ivory to beige, and their most distinctive feature is narrowed eyes, the target of many racist remarks, unfortunately. They stand from 5 to 5.11, and are thinner than most other humans. As you can see from these descriptions, most of the human peoples heavily resemble various linguistic and ethnic groups from our own world, but often with a more fantastical spin. Next, let's look at elves. Stegayan. The Stegayan are the origin of all other elves and can trace their ancestry back to their divergence from humans and enslavement under the Soraki Maesai. They are often treated as submissive and in need of authority, but that is disproven, once again, by their fierce resistance to oppression and slavery at the hands of humans. Their skin ranges from ivory to a honey color, and their hair covers all human colors, but lighter is much more common. Stegaians are generally taller and lankier than humans, with heights from 6 to 7 feet tall. Green. The Green Elves live in the rainforests and mountains of Morval, founding a united federation and becoming the center of elven culture and religion. They are thought of as pompous and disconnected, which tends to ring true, but they defend their lands with the zeal and passion of an angry dragon. Their skin tends to be darker, ranging from honey to espresso colored. They are shorter than most elves and fall within 5 to 6 feet, and I want to twist their alternate name of High Elves. Half Elves. Half Elves are the offspring of a human and an elf, inheriting traits of both, often with less pronounced pointed ears and slightly bulkier physiques. Elves often disown Half Elves and find them to be unholy abominations, and an elf has conspired with a slaver. Due to most early Half Elves being the offspring of, uh, let's just say, non consensual acts with humans. <sighs> humans, however, 
welcome most half-elves with open arms, treating them mostly as humans. Elves have shifted their perspectives recently, and some do allow half-elves to at least hold power, if not become leaders of elven kind. Elves were a shorter list, yet you can see that they follow a standard Tolkienian or D&D progression with slight variation. Next, the dwarves. Valdorian. The Valdorian dwarves are the last remnants of a great underground empire in Coleus. They mostly live in the high hills and lower valleys around the Valdor Mountains, often raiding nearby human and orcan lands. They are seen as savage raiders most often, but can be found working as smiths and warriors in the realms of humankind. Valdorian dwarves have lighter skin, ranging from ivory to beige, and their hair covers all human ranges, with darker being more common. They are short, with heights ranging from 3 to 4 feet, and bulky body plans with pronounced brows. Valdorian dwarves also revel in facial hair, with all genders sporting beards. Mork. The Mork dwarves are the most powerful race in Moraval, with the name of the continent even meaning kingdom in Valkamon. The Mork are more often slavers and feudal lords rather than craftsmen, seeking to always build their empire in a state of perpetual conflict and raiding. The Mork are stereotyped very much like their culture actually is, militaristic and authoritarian, with decadence being the sign of the affluent. Moric dwarves have darker skin, ranging from almond to golden. Skin color plays a large part in Moric society, with golden skin being the mark of nobility. Their hair is darker, but light tones are recorded and seen as divine favor. They are short and bulky, but taller than their Valdorian cousins, with heights from 3.6 to 4.6 feet. Tor d'amour, or half dwarves. The result of human enslavement and the brutal conquest of Moraval, half dwarves are generally shorter than humans with more pronounced brow ridges and a general propensity for facial hair. They are treated as second-class citizens in more society, but are often afforded more rights than other peoples in the empire. Among humans, they are generally welcomed, but with bigotry being common in more adjacent lands, overall they are a rare and chilling reminder of the sins of the Moric dwarves, yet also of the tenacity and perseverance of those cast down by society. Dwarves are more unique, with their mountainous stereotypes present in one group, but actively disparaged by another. Last, but least, only if you want your head cut off, are the orcs. Red orcs. The red orcs are most common in Coleus, and are seen as warriors and tribal savages whose land should never be entered. They hold many enclaves and sites across the continent, but Sakirana is the home of the red orcs. Their skin is slightly lighter, with olive and grey colors being common, even dark green has sometimes been observed. These orcs are large, with heights ranging from 7 to 8 feet tall. These orcs do not have facial hair, but instead markings that indicate tribe or allegiance. Bragvari The Bragvari are the original orcs. They roam the deserts of Bragvar, raiding and killing each other, but pledging fealty to one true matron as the ruler of all orc kind. They are often seen riding horses or megalanias through the desert, on the hunt for raiding targets or oases to settle down in. These orcs are massive with the largest reaching 10 feet and very bulky, leading to them often being called giants. Their skin tones are very dark, with them ranging from espresso to actually black, similar to a gorilla. Half Orcs Most orcs are not true orcs. Instead, due to the low population of males, most are half orcs. The half orcs are treated by all of the peoples, and especially orcs, as normal. Most half-orcs are the product of an orc or half-orc and a human, but some of the offspring of an elf or dwarf and reflect those respective characteristics. These half-orcs range from fully human with a skin tone change and larger size, to looking almost completely like a true orc. An orc with an elven parrot may have pointed ears, while one with a dwarven parrot may be shorter and can more easily grow facial hair. That brings us nicely to the conclusion. As you can see, all the various peoples in the world of Magnus tell us something about history and mythology in general, and different regions of the planet, more specifically. In the next episode, we will begin our dive into religion and the spiritual beliefs of the various peoples of this rich world. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider liking and subscribing, and Voso Kumuvata Samusi!